Hey there, I'm Danny Wilcox. I'm an entertainer in the realms of go go dance, YouTube, modeling, and adult media. I'm here to explore the world of the entertainment industry through the lens of consumers and entertainers alike. So brace yourself for some deep conversations with unique and talented individuals right here on Keeping People Coming. <laughs> Hello there and welcome to Keeping People Coming. I am your host, Danny Wilcox, and I'm here with... Steve Balderson. So Steve, tell the people, what is it that you do do? <laughs> I'm a director. Director? What kind of things do you direct? Movies, primarily. Sometimes individuals. Mm -hmm. Other times lovers. Other times waiters. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the situation and where you are. Yeah. So what kind of movies are your favorite to make? Not necessarily by genre, but by, I don't know, style, feel, emotional connection. Well, it's different because each one, it's like when I'm in that zone and I'm doing that movie, mm -hmm. I'm really interested in that thing. And then as soon as I finish it, I'm like, I want to do the polar opposite. So if I leave like a funny movie, I want to do something really heavy and serious. Yeah. Or vice versa. Yeah, kind of like how a painter is not just going to keep painting the same thing over and over again. They have completely different things, and sometimes they're related, sometimes not. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to making movies, um, what is your process like from start to finish? And the start could be whatever you determine it to be. Well, for this new one, um, the process came in a really slow way at first, and then really, really rapid. Mm -hmm. So I had an experience, I had a partner for just over a decade and I learned that he had stolen all my money and betrayed me and all this bullshit. Mm -hmm. And I, in the process of healing that, went to Italy, met a lover, had a sexual and spiritual reawakening. And I was telling this story to a friend of mine who's a publisher mm -hmm. at Punk Hostage Press. And she said, I have to tell this, you have to write this in a memoir and I'll publish it. And I was like, nobody cares, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And she was like, no, no, people, this is interesting. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So I, she convinced me and I wrote it and it was really crazy because it's like a combination of being really, really vulnerable and not caring at all at the same time and being really proud of who you are yeah. um, and where you've come from and the things that have happened to you. So around that time when I was working on, this, on the book, somebody said, why don't you make this into a movie? And at the time, again, I was like, yeah, I don't know, it's, I, not yet. Like it was a slow building process of convincing my mind artistically to want to do it. Yeah, like this project is worth all the energy it's gonna need. Yeah, and to come from a true place, like even though in some of my movies I have represented aspects of myself, mm -hmm. I've never fully gone so deep as to express myself, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, and so this one is different. And, and the movie, the working title is called Love Venezia, as you know, because mm -hmm. you're in it. And um, the book is called Year of the Whore, <laughs> which Sneak will- Sneak preview right here, people. Will explain, it's now, it's now available. You can get this on Amazon and anywhere you get your, it's on paperback and audiobook, Barnes and Noble, wherever you get books. It's, where, it's wherever books are sold. Um, Yearofthewhore.com will take you straight there. But it, uh, was a different kind of process because the moment I decided to do it mm -hmm. and to really just open up and allow it to happen, it was like it, within 48 hours it came together. I mean, not the script, but like the, the whole idea of doing it and the people involved. And um, some of the other ones took uh, similarly that fast and others were uh, longer. It, yeah. it depends on the one. I mean, I've made, this will be my 19th movie. Mm. So I, you know, they're all different in yeah. their own way. So as your ideas come uh, within a project you're already working on, and you're building it together. Um, sometimes they'll come a ton at once and sometimes it's a steady trickle. Uh, is it ever a, a combination of those two things? Yes. And sometimes a project will come to you, me, anyone, <laughs> when you're in the middle of another one. Mm -hmm. So it's not meant for now but it 
belongs on a postcard taped to the wall for next in line. Or yeah. I don't know. I look at sort of my creative world as like a big industrial stove in a restaurant with like 25 burners on it, right? Mm -hmm. And I've got a pot on half of them. And each one is a separate movie or a separate project. And they're all at various stages of, the, it was just put on, this one's boiling, this one's simmering. You know, like there's there's different ones for each thing. Yeah, and maybe for one you have to turn the heat down a little bit because yes. it needs to sit. Yeah, because it's it's boiling too fast. Or yeah. And this is all just like getting the ideas and conceptions together. This isn't even yet into the front of it, the actual uh, like uh, recording video and finding right. your actors and all that. Right. So. Ooh. So how did you end up get it, getting into filmmaking in the first place? Well, to be honest, I mean, I was going to say I can't do anything else very well. <laughs> so it was always something that I just gravitated towards. I mean, I can do a couple things in the world, like make a sandwich. Well, yes. And maybe a, and a dinner every now and again. But, but you like, don't want to work at Jimmy John's. No, 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 I don't. I mean, I could, because when we were doing the COVID thing, I had, um, I took the food handler safety test mm -hmm. so I could be a certified caterer. Mm -hmm. And so I would be eligible for an earlier vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> so technically, I could work at Jimmy John's. I just don't want to. For um, reasons. Yeah. And, uh, You're not a sandwich artiste. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> you haven't had one of my sandwiches yet. That's true. That's true. Tomorrow, you might disagree. Okay. <laughs> now, I have a whole thing about sandwiches, but um, no, it was like the earliest way I felt most at home. Mm -hmm. So it was like my grandfather had given me like an old VHS camcorder mm -hmm. to just play with. How old were you then? <sighs> Five, six. So really early. You yeah. Knew. I mean, four, I don't, I don't remember, but it, it felt like the language of it was my language. Mm -hmm. And was it always just making the films that you were drawn to or uh, was it watching them as well? Mm. As a movie goer? Mm -hmm. So, so. I think at first it was appealing to me to explore, and still is. You know, I had never seen a Bergman film until three years ago. I and, still haven't. Okay. <laughs> and when you, and so then if I discover that, for myself, then I'll exhaust it. I will watch every single one. I'll obsess over it until I've seen all of them. I've analyzed all of them, you know, all this stuff. And there are too many in the world. So it's, it's I respond to the instinctual synchronicity of what I need to do. It will come to me and I will find it mm -hmm. at the same time. Yeah, you're not trying to look for specific inspiration because you already have your own ideas. You don't need to piggyback off of other people's. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Or you realize, I, I learned early on that Everything has already been done. There is nothing original anymore. And people who say that, whatever. But Why what, so many sequels? Well, and sure. Remakes. But here, like, so this, uh, cheers. Cheers. <laughs> this glass, mm -hmm. like, the form of these glasses is the same. Mm -hmm. And they have the same purpose, but they look entirely different. So if I was inspired by this form and said, what would I do? What would, how would my spin on it be? It would be this, but it directly is derivative of this. Mm -hmm. And that's everything that's ever been made in the world. Hmm. There's not really much media, particularly film, that comes from nowhere because there was much more art that existed before film that inspired it in the first place. Exactly. I mean, there are, you know, just a few basic stories yeah. in the world and they're all the same, but there's how you present them and the twist you do on them that makes the difference. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel like the emotionality is another thing that can be played with so, so much. Um, of course, I'm only, uh, I've only recently started getting into watching films, and that's the other side of the entertainment of films. Um, yeah. So with uh, films, what of uh, your 19 that you've made so far has been your favorite to create? Well, it's always the one I'm working on now. <laughs> so right now it's Love Venezia, which is the name of a portion of the Year of the Horror. Mm -hmm. um, and I've taken other parts of the book into it also, but... The movie, as it's called now, Love Venezia, and we're doing a crowdfunding on Indiegogo this month for Pride Month, so check it out. Um, yes, do it. It is my love right now because it's my most deeply sincere one, mm -hmm. first of all. And then secondly, it's just what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. I would say that each movie is almost like a, a child. So, you know, each child has their own thing, their own energy, 
they may or may not become successful, quote unquote, in the world, but you still love them equally. Yeah. So I can't say that I have a favorite, but I have love for each one of them individually. Yeah, and in different ways. In totally different ways. So going to the actual process itself again, uh, what sort of things happen along um, conception of the idea to actually making the film, to editing, to uh, like the release and um, publicizing the film? What bumps are very common in, in that road that people might not expect? <clears throat> well, a lot of filmmakers make this mistake, and artists in general, is they create whatever it is they're making mm -hmm. and then ask themselves afterwards how to market this. And what I've learned is that if you reverse engineer it in the opposite way, so that you know how you're going to market your film before you write it, before you make it, then all the decisions that come in the process of writing it and making it, if you think about, does that relate to how I'm going to sell this? Mm -hmm. Why will anyone want to watch this? Then it informs how you make it. Yeah. And so I would say focus on how you're going to market it who who is going to watch this mm -hmm. why do they want to and then every choice you make along the way should be a part of that yeah well that's like well any art you're creating you're not just creating it for yourself and of course right. some artists do but in like society today you need to be making money to survive and you want people sure. to see your art so that does factor in so having not necessarily commercialization but being able to market it and have people see this creation mm. like that's like paramount to creating movies. Yeah, I, I, I have a friend who, well, she's not even a friend anymore. She's insane. She <laughs> was the lead singer of Concrete Blonde, the band from the 80s. And she had an album that was, she did the score for my first film, mm -hmm. Pep Squad, which is also on Tubi and Prime Video. Um, Ooh, I didn't yeah. know it was on Tubi. I'll have to check that out. It's good, it's fun. It's a, it's a satire on school violence that was made prior to Columbine. So it's, timely i mean it's pretty heavy at this point but it's also a satire and it's funny yeah it's very dark but she scored that and she did her own like solo record at some point for chris blackwell and island and then they didn't end up releasing it and they gave her back her tapes and i think they're still sitting in a closet like mm -hmm. she never released it and there was a film i was involved with once that you know they just didn't finish it mm -hmm. and i was like what is the purpose for that like I don't quite understand making something that you never share. I don't understand that. I would think it's because uh, the artist has something inside themselves that they don't like and they're trying to get it out to understand it, but it's not how they want it to be. So mm. just like that part of themselves they don't like, they just shove it down. It didn't exist. It's not there. That would be my first guess, but... That sounds about right. I mean, sort of in the denial, let's bury it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, I know there was a Sam Raimi movie that he wanted all copies destroyed, gone. And my mm. boyfriend had one, and he ended up getting uh, some communication from Sam like Sam, uh, that was pretty nasty, telling him he needed to get rid of it. I, th I think it was actually a film reel. I don't remember mm. the title of it or anything. I'll have to ask him. Um, but, like, yeah, that direct interaction, which is kind of funny because I went to college with his daughter, Emma Raimi. Cool. Mm -hmm. So with filmmaking, um, what's it like working with actors? Because you hear all sorts of stories about big Hollywood films and like actors having egos and things, but that's not <clears> all of them. Well, a lot of the people that I've worked with, with the exception of two, um, don't have egos. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because of the approach. Oftentimes I will approach a movie in a project and I'm really upfront with, you know, it's, this is going to be very small. It's very intimate. Um, we're not gonna have fancy trailers and fancy things and chairs with your names on them. Like we, we mm -hmm. don't have, that's bullshit. Like yeah. spend the money elsewhere. Um, and if somebody's really attached to those ego driven things, they're either offended or they, they're put off by it and they don't do it. But when we did the casserole club, which has been re-released -re as sex, lies and sugar, mm -hmm. which is also on Tubi and Prime Video. <laughs> This is not me plugging everything I've done, but it just happens to come up. When we were filming that movie with Kevin Richardson from the Backstreet Boys and Jane Weedlin of the Go-Go's and Daniel C. Uh, from the L Word um, 
and a bunch of other people in it, Susan Trailer and mm -hmm. Storina Johnson. That I'm not aware of, showing my age. Okay, well, <laughs> anyway, the um, it was like summer camp. Hmm. So at the end of the day, when we're making dinner together, and there's a Backstreet Boy and a Go-Go and, you know, this great actor from TV and like some other stuff, and, and we're just all gathered around singing mm -hmm. and making food and sharing. T like, that's the most precious, amazing magic yeah. to I mean, make movies. Artists are artists and they recognize each other. And when someone has an ego, it's kind of saying, I am higher up than you. And sure. that's just not really an artistic point of view because no. recognizability and the amount of money you make is not representative of what the art itself is doing. No, because here on that set, you know, we had millionaires and starving artists mm -hmm. together at one, you know, like, and, and having this amazing time. So sometimes working with actors, I mean, then, then you get into like how to work with them, um, you know, what their style is or, um, you know, how they might have an idea for something. For, for instance, like yeah. every actor is like, I think we should do this scene this way. And what I always say is it takes less time to tell them that their idea is stupid to just do it. Mm -hmm. Like it takes less time to just do it mm -hmm. than it does to try to explain that. So yeah. I'm just like, okay, here's what we'll do. We'll do it one way, just how it's written. Mm -hmm. We'll do it a second way, your way. And then how about we do a third way just for fun? What's you know? the third way? It's just, it's neither of the other two. It's, let's just make it up. Let's put the script away. Let's do the scene without any of those words. Well, just knowing where you're starting, where you're ending, and what's in yes. between is. Or sometimes I'll do, like on the new one, I want to do um, a version of every take or every scene without using any words. So it's like, how would you communicate everything that's written mm -hmm. by body language alone? That's just making me think of silent movies and how they have yes. some words on the screen, but it's like one... Uh, I guess one line or one set of words per scene. So the actors really had to ham it up almost like live theater. And I, the specific movie I was watching was Nosferatu. Mm. And you see their expressions, they're just like. <sighs> right, right, right. Well, it was very theatrical back mm -hmm. then too. So it's like, yeah, I, I would not say do it that way. But well, like... I mean, cameras are a lot better now. You can pick up on subtlety so much better. Yeah, yeah. You got to just like, you know, do a little something. Yeah, yeah. We're working on it. Um. <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite an actor yet. 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 Um, yeah, so that's that. Mm -hmm. So what is the most fun part of the movie making process for you? Or is it different from movie to movie? Lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers to that. Cheers. Oh. Um, no, I'm serious. So like when we were on my film Culture Shock, also on Tubi and Prime Video. <laughs> um, we were in London on, on location shooting. And I typically like to break for lunch at lunchtime. Yeah. It makes sense. Mm -hmm. Most of the film world breaks like six hours in. It's like they don't feed anybody until six hours in because that's like a rule, like a standard tradition or you know, just an understood rule. And I think call time that morning was at 9.30 or 10. So we literally worked for an hour and a half or two hours. And then I said, we're breaking for lunch. And they're like, are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> All the actors were just like, what? Like, we've only been here for two hours. And I'm like, yeah, but it's lunchtime. So I, lunch is my favorite part. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel like there's a lot more to that because I was working with a photographer um, who's done a lot of DPA, director of photography. I know what mm. you're thinking. Um, but she was on a music <laughs> video for Grimes and said that, Grimes was way more interested in talking and getting to know everyone, or talking to and getting to know everyone on the set than in the actual video itself. Yeah. And like getting to know each other, getting that like sense of community makes the collaboration so much better because all art that has more than one person is a collaboration. Totally. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody has an ingredient they bring to the dish. Mm -hmm. And if you respond and interact with the ingredients, you're getting the best out of them. Yeah. And as the director, you are kind of like the chef curating those ingredients, deciding what goes where and when and how, like how it's prepared. Like, do I need to add uh, parsley or cilantro? Exactly. Like, things like that. And there are several combinations that might be good, but it's your dish. It's your idea in your head. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So going with the food metaphor, since that's kind of fun and we're talking about lunch, um, do you, have you ever had any experiences where there was an ingredient that soured the whole dish? Oh, yeah. Hmm. Garlic. Garlic. I mean, it's great on almost everything. 
Mm -hmm. But if you put too much, like there's a, there's a brilliant, you know, you could put 40 cloves in it and it could taste amazing. But once you hit, there's a threshold, depending on the dish and what it is you're making, if you go too much, it covers up everything else. Yeah. And then you can't taste anything else. You just lose it all. Do you have any anecdotes that relate that to any filmmaking experiences? Um, no. No. Well, I do want to mention some, one of your films, one that I've seen because I haven't seen a ton. There was a certain ingredient, and by that I mean Karen Black, who mm. made the whole dish amazing. And without it, oh, sorry. I don't know how it would have been. But she was like the star, like she was the movie in my heart, really. And I, I, I'd imagine other people have felt the same. But what was it like working with her? Karen was amazing. She was a total pro. I mean, yes, she's a diva, but not on set, like not when it comes to the craft. Ah. So, you know, we had lots of really great talks, and the second time we worked together was one of my most exciting moments which i write about at the end of my first book which was filmmaking confidential mm -hmm. which i was my own cinematographer for that film so it was literally me as my own camera person and director karen and the sound guy on set and everybody else was outside mm -hmm. and when i looked around and i was like wow this is so amazing that it's just us and we're just like kids playing you know, but yet we're using our craft with skill. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we're just kids playing in the backyard, but it was at the same time, just like kids playing in the backyard. Yeah. And she was so able to play. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. Well, that's getting into flow states, which if you don't know, yeah. flow state is when you're doing something that comes so naturally and just realistically to you that your brain almost shuts off for people who enjoy driving. That's often one where you're on your way home and you know every possible route. Suddenly you're home and you didn't even need to think about it. You just turned your brain off, but not in a bad way. I right. used to get that when I would play the cello. I sometimes get that when I'm filming adult videos. Not as much because you really have to focus on a lot mm. of specific things. And with kids, playing just comes naturally to them. Yeah. And especially when it comes to art, that's the best kind. It's not grueling. It's not trying to force something out just for the sake of reaching the end and like having to make money out of it. And that's why I tell people, if you have a hobby, don't start trying to make money off of it unless you know you can, because you're going to start hating it. Mm. You're gonna, like if you like crocheting and it's like, oh, I have to make 10 scarves by the end of the week, like your hands are going to start hurting and you're yes. going to resent it. And that's not worth it. No, totally. I mean, there's part of the reason of having a habit is to escape. Mm -hmm. So that you can like, after your busy day of bullshit, you can sit down and enjoy something that nobody cares you know it's exactly. like it's just you in that place yeah so uh when you're done with the film it's been released you've done your marketing um do you feel a sense of relief yes alchemy of the spirit <clears throat> to be prime video <laughs> I, I recommend it came out in january and it stars xander berkeley and sarah clark and when that came out and we did pr until i think the end of february um I was so excited to have it out mm -hmm. because it had, it had also been, you know, labored over throughout the pandemic. So it was something that was done very, very slowly. I knew that there was no rush because I didn't want to have it in film festivals if I couldn't go to them, yeah. you know, in person. So it premiered at Fantas Porto in Portugal and then won over 25 awards worldwide. And it was, it was well received and it was really a lot of fun and it's about grief and recovery and um, moving on after death. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've met a lot of people whom it's helped, which I didn't expect. I didn't, I didn't have that intention going into making it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, when a movie comes out, there's excitement to share it and also an excitement to move on. Yeah, It's like, I can't wait to do the next thing. Mm -hmm. Well, because you know, the next project is always going to be coming and as you said you have other things like on burners or that eight ingredients you're ready to keep going yeah like there's no need to stop like i'd imagine sometimes though you do need to take a brief break right yeah like a week <laughs> week or so no i mean like even if i go to like hawaii and i'm sitting on a beach i can totally relax for like three days and then i'm like all right come on let's mm -hmm. i don't need the sand again today like yeah. i i just want to go do something yeah i'm a productive 
I have an entrepreneurial spirit. Like I just I want to make stuff. Yeah, and you with your like well with entertainment in general, people typically get to show something that they love on screen, and they really get to share a part of themselves, and it impacts people in ways that you don't really anticipate. True, and it's always the case. And you know, on the flip side, you can never appeal to everybody. No. There will always be ten percent of the people in the world who hate you, hate what you do, despise you, turn their nose up, whatever. So if you just focus on the other people mm -hmm. and you make your work and you share it and you do it for both sharing and kindness and compassion, even if it's dark, it doesn't have to be kind per se, mm -hmm. but if there's a message in it, if there's a reason you're doing it, um, just do it and then move on. Don't linger. It's like the people who, I don't understand lingering over a work or being hesitant to release it or you well, particularly over the opinions of people who aren't going to like it because those are not the people it's made for in the first no, place. No, exactly. But if you don't think about that ahead of time, I can understand how that can be confusing. Yeah. Well, you're like, oh, I didn't realize this could be taken that way. Maybe I need to rethink how I did this specific thing. Mm. I do have to say, uh, and I've said this before, I love my haters. They fuel me not necessarily to be better, but to just be. Sure. Yeah. And my favorite thing uh, when it comes to creating any sort of art is the impact it has on people that I really don't expect. Like, mm -hmm. um, not that long ago, I had people start messaging me online, um, not really uh, people coming up to me in person, but uh, they would say, like, I wanted to get into and I just, I didn't really see people who looked like me, mm. um, or, like, I didn't see people who expressed themselves in the way I do, but then I saw you on screen, and I just lit up, like, this is something I could do. You inspired me. And I think that's just the most beautiful thing that somebody can tell me about my work. Totally. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. I had to take saucy pictures for my book release for Year of the Horror. Oh, yeah, I saw a few. I show him a few because <laughs> I was like, hey, I did this. And there's something so vulnerable about just being proud of who you are, even if you're not this or that mm -hmm. or the other. You know, it's like, hey, you know, I'm a 48 year old man and I am who I am and I have my set of experiences and my story mm -hmm. and I'm proud of them. Yeah. And this will hopefully, even if somebody else says, you know, that's ridiculous or stupid or whatever, someone somewhere will be inspired, hopefully, mm -hmm. by something. Maybe. I hope. I mean, I, maybe not. Maybe who could, you know, but it yeah. doesn't matter. It's like, as a person, I have been inspired by other people who may or may not have intended to be inspiring to me, but mm -hmm. they were. Yeah. Well. Uh, for me, with my work that I do, I'm on screen, I'm right there, and mm. people always think like, oh, this is so vulnerable, they're, they're seeing you in these like crazy positions, fully nude, like being intimate with someone else, uh, whereas for you, your name is on there, but people mm. don't see you, yet I kind of would think that what you do is a little bit more vulnerable, because you're really pulling like ideas from parts of your brain, and you may be putting more of yourself into the work, whereas I'm just kind of putting on some sort of persona, like a switch flicks, and suddenly... I am no longer like who I am every day. I am Danny Wilcox, like performer. Yeah, I think this new one's different because it is truly me. Mm -hmm. um, the Love Venezia movie, so it's it's more like deeply personal. But like, for instance, there was a character uh, in my film Watch Out who is the lead. Who is he's a narcissist and he's in naked in half of it, and um, That's about right. he is obsessed with himself. And he's like, he's not turned on by men or women, just himself. So he has this blow up doll that he like paints, he like tapes a picture of himself to like a headshot on the head of it. And so you he can fuck it. You're giving people ideas right here. No, I know. So <laughs> watch out. Uh, prime video. Um, I mean, it was a big hit for like TLA in like 2008, whenever the hell it came out. Um, and it was just re-released, thankfully, so that people everywhere can see how insane it is. But there's this moment in this like bathroom in this strange restaurant that he's jerking off and there's this ejaculation shot that happens in it for real like it just it really is full on there it's not cgi it's nothing it's like the actual point of coming mm -hmm. and when i did that when i filmed it i didn't do it i filmed it um when the actor did it i i hesitated because i thought is this pushing it too far is this crossing a line and I mean, I know that there have been actual sex in mainstream movies yeah. for a long time. So it wasn't like the first time that happened, but I, I was a little nervous. And it was so great because when that movie premiered in Hollywood, Karen Black came up to me afterwards and said, I am so glad you took it that far. 
because it needed to be. Mm-hmm. It kind of takes it to another level, doesn't it? Yeah, because then it becomes almost like beyond, beyond both. It's like a different form. And yeah. the fact that she told me that, I was like, ah, oh, then sure, I got nothing to worry about. I mean, there were other people who were like offended or astounded or whatever. But it's just, I don't know, people, when they, there's so much shame and judgment that goes into the naked body and being who we are that I'm not surprised. Yeah. Really. Well, just natural processes in general have a stigma. Like, I was amazed to hear that Psycho was the first movie to have a toilet flushing, like, Mm. on screen. Like, and that was taboo. It's like, it's a toilet. Everyone hears it every day. No, or like the Brady Bunch. They had, like, two separate beds, and it was the first time on television they showed a man, a husband and a wife in the same bed. Yeah, and it's like, these people are married and have children. Like, you know they're having sex. Like, exactly. It's like, why do we have to hide behind these things that everyone knows are there? Which is why, it reminds me of, so in The Year of the Whore, the book, I realized that I like having sex in the middle of the day. Mm-hmm. When you can see what you're doing. And it's kind of fun to see what's going on. I'd say so. <laughs> so I then thought, why do people often, I became really curious, like, why do they wait until night when it's dark? And they can close all the windows and blinds and turn off all the lights so they can't see anything. I think they were taught to be ashamed. I think so too. To be secretive. Yeah. I mean, I understand not having to out in the open in public well, in front sure. of people, but <laughs> you should never be ashamed of your body. That's where no. you end up with people who are like, or the person, oh, I don't look like someone on TV, so I need to. Yeah, or the person you're with. Like if it's your partner mm-hmm. or your spouse or someone you're just dating or mm-hmm. a hookup, it doesn't matter. If you aren't comfortable seeing them or them seeing you what are you doing Mm -hmm. and when you hide things even if there actually is a real problem with it if you hide it that's almost like saying this doesn't exist so i don't want to see it so all of those people who i'd say who say this person did something bad therefore anything they've done and anything they do is bad and we need to hide it like no i do think there is some degree of separation of art and artists what do you have to say about that yeah because sometimes you're working in metaphor Mm -hmm. And you're making up, I mean, storytelling is the greatest form of sharing information. Mm, you know, if I just sit here and preach to you for an hour, you're going to be like, eh, maybe, maybe not. But and if I, I remember it no, <laughs> but if I tell you a story, you might remember the story mm-hmm. and deduct your own reasoning afterwards. Yeah. Well, humans always told their stories word of mouth for a long time. And in um, Australia, the Aborigines, they, they, of course, have been there for tens of thousands of years mm-hmm. and there were scientists who couldn't explain i think uh, a certain like rock a rock formation or why the landscape looked this way and the aborigines had these stories that uh, passed from word of mouth like oh this is what happened like there was this great natural disaster and this landed here and then eventually scientists realized it but these people already knew it word of mouth right like they just didn't need proof so like storytelling really is like the oldest uh, quality of man mm. And you carrying it on, um, I don't know, does that ever feel like a, a weight or like just a grand thing that you were tasked with? Oh, I've never thought of it that way. No. But I, now thinking about it that way, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, kind of. Because when I got the Watch Out, which is based on a book, and I got the book, the author really wanted me to adapt it, make it into a movie. And I said, sure. And then I read the book. And when I read the book, I thought, this is so extreme and, and no one in their right mind would have the guts to make this movie. So within about 30 seconds, I knew that I was the only one that had to. Like, I had to. That's about right. So, like, again, when I did The Year of the Whore, the book, and I'm like, I need to tell this story. I'm the only one that has the balls to do it. Yeah. These are the, these are the things that most people aren't willing to say. No. Yeah, it's like if somebody is doing or being a bully to a bunch of other people, you need to just have guts to stand up and say like, "Hey, like, fuck you, stop." Yeah, it. and most people just won't. Right. Not that there's necessarily well, you risk standing back, but like you risk the push, the punch down, the the reaction from the, la- the backlash. Yeah, you risk it, but you know, I say if you're true to yourself on your deathbed, at the end of your life, looking back, will you have made the choices you made? the way you needed to make them? Mm -hmm. Or were you living somebody else's life? Who is driving your bus? (laughs) You know, Mm -hmm. it's like, are you driving your life or is someone else? And I, it's hard to drive your own. 
Yeah. Well, did wisdom come from other people's mistakes, or should you make your own? Hey, both. I'd say so. If you don't learn from other people's mistakes, then they did it for nothing. Totally. I mean, there's also something to be said about the kids who, you know, their parents say, don't touch the burner, you'll burn your hand. Yeah. They have no idea what that means. And then the day comes along when they will touch the burner and burn their hand and say, oh, that's what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Now they know. Burn, hand, burner, burner. Oh, hand. Well, speaking yeah. of telling uh, <laughs> children what to do and like direction, you're a director, so mm. you direct people. Are you naturally more of the dominant type in your everyday life? Yes. <laughs> so continuing in this vein, um, do you like it when you get a little bit of pushback? Do you feel like it pushes you into a new mind creatively or do you think it's just derailing you? Oh, no, I think it's very telling. Mm -hmm. And it's telling on, it tells, it tells me, it's more informative to me about that person. Mm -hmm. So I have a belief. It's not even a belief. I don't like belief. I like knowing. <laughs> Believing in something that you don't experience is beside the point to me. I like to know it. I want to experience it. Mm -hmm. So I have realized that there is no such thing as judgment. It's a construct. Mm -hmm. And it's something we're taught. The animal world doesn't have it. You know, a lion goes and eats the goat for dinner because he's a lion. Mm -hmm. It's not a murderer. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like there's a there's a there's a cycle here we could get into that would take an hour to talk through. So we're not gonna do it. But like, um, no, when I have had a negative feedback or a negative criticism, and for instance, this is an example, it's not happened, but let's say I've done a comedy and the purpose of it is as it is. And one of the critics might say, oh, I didn't believe there was anything serious about this movie. Well, that tells me that that person didn't want to watch a comedy. That person wanted to watch a drama or something mm -hmm. more serious. Well, that doesn't really relate anything about the actual film itself. No. And so the thing is, the only true thing that exists in the world is what is. It's Again, it's like our glasses. They are two totally different glasses. Neither one of these is good or bad or that's, right or that's wrong. A, that's a personal like opinion, really. Well, yeah, you can have personal opinions. I'm not for war movies. I don't care for war movies, mm -hmm. but they're not bad. Yeah, just because you like or don't like something doesn't mean it's more or less important in general. It just is. Yeah. This is just a glass. That's just a glass. Mm -hmm. It's just a glass. Oh, yes, cheers. <laughs> um, so yeah. we are going to take a brief break to uh, powder our noses, you know, do everything else you need to do, the hair, whatever. We'll be right back. And we are back. Back, mm. Steve Balderson. So we're gonna jump right into it. Uh, by the way, we were talking the whole time that the camera was off, and you guys didn't get to see any of it. And we really should have been filming for a variety of reasons that some of you pay money to see. <laughs> yes, but uh, I want to talk about a few of the things that came up. So mm. uh, we talked about styles of directing. What exactly is your style? I don't remember what I said. Oh, oh no, that? I do. I said um, I. What I said is doesn't matter. What the truth is, is <laughs> I can answer that way. Um, I like to let the actor be themselves. I mean, let them be. Let them do what they're going to do. And if I have cast it correctly and evaluated all the decisions why I've cast this person in this part, my job should be pretty much done, mm -hmm. as is theirs. And if I've cast it incorrectly, it may be a lot harder for me to get the performance out of them that I want. And it may be harder for them to give me the performance that I want. Yeah. So I, I, if I cast it correctly and they, I just allow them to do what they do, then they just do it. And if that isn't quite what I was going for, then I give a little direction. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't work, I give a little more. You know, it's like you just got to... I, I want to just push it a little bit this mm -hmm. way, a little bit that way, if it's not quite right. But typically, the first shot, the first take of if I've cast it correctly is perfect. Yeah, the but, actor knows their lines. They know what they need to do. You pick them for this. Like. Yeah, and then you just do another one for safety or mm -hmm. for a variety or variation. You know, it's like do one your way, do one my way, and then let's just do one for fun. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel like that presents a problem with uh, casting someone explicitly or exclusively for their name because you yeah. may want the attention that they will bring but if they don't fit exactly you're gonna have to give more direction and if they do
you have a big name and it kind of gets to them, then they're going to tell you, like, no, it needs to be this way. And they'll be, like, hijacking your movie. Well, and sometimes it's their idea is not so great. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a toss-up. But I say, you know, uh, deal with that all ahead of time. Mm-hmm. Like, before you actually get into doing it, have all those discussions. That actually it gives me a thought. Something I've said before, um, the problem with improv comedy. Have you ever done improv comedy? Just daily in so, life. So you know the main rule of it, right? Well, yes, and. Yes, and. But as a director, it's your job to say no, but. Mm. And I think mm. in improv... That, that that's re- relevant because they're not <clears throat> all ideas are good no but it takes less time to just do yes and than it does to tell you that your idea is bad mm-hmm. well but then for a movie you can p- pick between the takes but if you're doing like live improv oh no i know but even right there you said no but sure well the idea is when you're filming you can do the take however you want and i will use the other one mm-hmm. but you don't know that mm-hmm and so to keep your morale high and your spirits engaged, I might just elect to make you think we're doing the story your way, when in fact, secretly, I'm getting all the moments I need to do it my way. Mm-hmm. And you won't know until you see it. Yeah, I and mean, that's the thing with collaborating. If everyone's quite on the exact same level, then all ideas are equal. And if something takes away from someone else's idea or derails it, then that's not really a consideration anymore. Right. And a lot of people, of course, don't want to put anyone else down and they don't want to make them feel bad about it. But ultimately, when the goal is to create one specific art uh, art piece that's in someone's, not necessarily in their image, but it is their creation, like they have to take control. Right. Mm-hmm. One person can hold the brush. Yeah. A, and... di- a different person can pull the canvas. A different person can mix the paints. You can dictate where they paint the brush, you know, color in the lines, but it's like, there needs to be one voice. Mm-hmm. So with movies, genre is something that's talked about a lot. Mm. And um, I have certain ones, of course, I'm drawn to. Most people do. But your movies aren't exactly like neat cut, this genre, this genre. How but, would you describe them? Well, the new one is. Love, Venezia is the only gay romance film that doesn't have anger, violence, disease, drugs. It's just a pure expression of love. Well, I do have one that I, I would um, it, it kind of insist you watch eventually called Weekend. It oh, no, I know a, this. Okay, yeah, that one's similar, but it's still not quite as deep as this. No, like, not and, at all. No, but if, and even if you look at Call Me By Your Name, which was kind of close, they didn't even talk for 35 minutes of the movie. They hated each other. It's like, can't we just have a love story? Mm-hmm. Between people who love each other? Because that does happen. It does. Mm -hmm. It happens in life. And those are actual depictions of other aspects of the gay community. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they don't exist. They're out there all over the place. But I've seen it. I would like to watch something different. Mm -hmm. So in this case, this one is the one that fits perfectly in the box. But most oftentimes, I I have been known for combining. You know, it's like, It's part horror, it's part comedy. Smash it together. Or it's part campy, it's part dark, heavy. Smash it together. And then there's a psychological component that's not necessarily like a mind, but it's there. Yes, yes. And I I will go back and forth. I I oscillate in this world. So Mm -hmm. after I do this movie, I might want to do something completely ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So now I kind of want to veer a little bit and get real technical. Mm. So when it comes to uh, like the post-production stuff, well, I guess, no, it would be production, not post, um, with actually cutting the scenes together and figuring out the lighting and everything like that. How much involvement do you have in that process? Tons. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I see the image, the composition, and then I get my DP, Hanuman, director of photography, for those of you who weren't paying attention earlier. Yeah. yeah. Um, and... We talk about it all. I mean, from the point of even just what's the ratio? What's the canvas? Mm-hmm. Is it 16 by 9? Is it cinemascope? Is it square? Is it, you know, what is the canvas? Like the, the borders we're giving ourselves. And then how, what's it look like? Is it bright? Is it edgy? Is it dark? Is it gritty? Is it warm? Is it like oranges and reds and golds? Or is it like blues and purples and cold? And, mm-hmm. you know, like what is the, the, what are the colors and textures going into it? 
um, once we've done all those things and we've gone through the list of like defining it, then I let him play. Mm -hmm. It's like what I do with the actors. It's like if yeah. you if you work with the right people, you want them to do what they are gifted at. Yeah, you pick them for a reason. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Like I have picked you for a specific reason, which all of you will see why and all of you already probably know. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm going to have <laughs> other things that I might contribute to the movie here and there. Maybe it's just ideas. Maybe it's uh, who knows what else. Well, exactly. And it's also, it's fun to get to a scene where you have scripted something or you have an idea of, okay, we're going to start with A, like you said earlier, and then we're going to end with C. But B could really be anything. Mm -hmm. As long as you start with A and end at C. Mm -hmm. So you can play around with, is okay, let's do one funny. Mm -hmm. Let's do one serious. Let's do one sad. Let's do whatever. You can play around with so many different Bs that it doesn't matter so long as you move from A to C. Exactly. So I know for a lot of your films, you end up doing a lot of the scripting for it, right? Mm. So uh, I, some. Some of it. So how does that look from movie to movie? Um, I have written outright only three or four of my movies. Does that mean like just you with no co-writers? Correct. Okay. And a lot of times I'll have somebody else do the first draft mm -hmm. and then I'll rewrite it okay. or I'll do like an edit or a polish. Is that particularly different from the movie industry in general? Um, I think I'm sure every, every project is different. Mm -hmm. I mean, in television, I think that the writers are the ones where they're walking down the streets with the picket signs. Well, right now, I mean, <laughs> when this airs, maybe not, but like, hopefully not. Um, but the, uh, I, I think it's just the style, the approach. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm I'm not so attached to the words on the pay, paper, the page, um, because I want the freedom to let the actor bring their own voice into it. Mm -hmm. There are certain lines every now and again that I'm like, I love the way that sounds. I don't want to change it. But I'm not too particular. Uh, so talking about writing, I'm curious to hear uh, what your writing is like. Do you have any samples for us? Oh my god. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> I could read from Year of the Whore. Oh, I just opened it up to the chapter of 007. 007, what a title. 007. Okay, shall I? Yeah, go ahead. Let's give these people a little preview of something. Draw them in. A few weeks after I ended it with Sean the Pizza Boy, which is chapter two called The Year of the Whore, and you can read that. <laughs> I think that's the chapter my character's in. It is. We could read that in a minute, but I, I just opened it to 007, so I thought, why not? I started messaging a guy on the app. I quickly learned he was a soldier in the U.S. Army and stationed at Fort Riley, a military base just 30 miles from Wamigo, Kansas, which is where I'm from. Home to soldiers and families of the 1st Infantry Division, approximately 15,000 active duty service members live at Fort Riley. The 1st Infantry Division is a, combination, a combined arms division of the United States Army and is the oldest continuously serving division of the regular army, the professional corps of the United States Army. It has been seen continuous service. Jesus, it's, now it's getting darker in here. Um, it has seen continuous service since its organization in 1917 during World War I. It was officially nicknamed the Big Red One. No, I don't That's need that. The no. The Big Red One, which is abbreviated bro after the design and color of its shoulder patch. He looked incredibly muscular in pictures, and he told me he got his strength from being a soldier, not from being in the gym. He had ice blue eyes, perfectly smooth skin, and sun-kissed blonde hair, probably about six feet tall, originally from San Diego. There wasn't a thing about this guy that didn't scream stud. He was okay sharing cell numbers, but for discretion and security reasons, he would not tell me his name. So I nicknamed him. I'll call you 007, I said. It just seemed to fit. I'm good with that, he said. He was happily married to a woman and had two kids, he told me. I'm totally heterosexual, except I have this insatiable hunger for sucking dick, he said. And I mean insatiable. Hetero? Oh. 
Whatever. A hot soldier with an appetite for dinner was plenty good for me. Me and my wife have a hot sex life, he said. But you know, she can't really satisfy my craving for co He was trying to find someone in the area to service and, he wa and wanted no reciprocation. A serviceman who needed a man to service? This just keeps getting better, I thought. Every guy I want to... Every guy I meet wants to suck me or they want me to fuck them, he said, presenting a problem I refuse to see as a problem. But he was clear that he did, that did not appeal to him. I'm kind of running out of options, he said, so maybe that's where you come in. He was lucky. This situation happened to fit my very strict policy of not turning down gorgeous men who beg me for sex. Out of the generosity of my heart, I said, and yes, I used those words. I'm happy to help you. <clears throat> I'm happy to help you out with that. After all, he was a soldier and busy defending our great nation. It was the least I could do. We settled on an arrangement. It was decided that if I ever wanted to be serviced, no matter the time of day, or the time or day, I could simply text him with the words, What's up? Meaning my dick. If he was free to text back right away, he would. Otherwise, I would stop texting. Instead, I was to wait patiently until he could reply. Likewise, any time he was hungry and needed some protein, as he called it, he would text me with, need service? I saved his number in my phone as 007, and he listed me in his as Sergeant Steve. About a week later, on a, sunny, on a sunny Saturday morning, I was eating breakfast when my phone dinged. It was 007. Suddenly, I was wide awake. <laughs> no, no coffee needed. After need service, he wrote, free for an hour. Meet me in the Sears parking lot. Oh, I did. And it continues. Mm -hmm. Into the Sears parking lot. <laughs> So on that note, I think uh, we're getting a little bit close to the end on time. So I want to finish up by asking you, is there anything about just the entertainment industry from your experience that you would like to share with our viewers? Well, again, it's a whole subsection and a second episode. Pornography is a construct. It doesn't exist. Hmm. Everything that we consider pornography today won't be in the future there is art in the louvre that was considered pornography hmm. there are cultures who view certain things as pornographic that others celebrate as something else mm -hmm. so it's a construct yeah well and just because some people look down on something doesn't mean it needs to be looked down on. it just is a form of human sexuality mm -hmm. it's a part of just life for everyone although there was a movie I saw recently, Demolition Man, where uh, Sandra Bullock asks Sylvester Stallone, do you want to have sex? And it turns out it's this VR weird thing, like they don't actually do it anymore. And of course, that's framed as being ridiculous and insane. And I feel like it really is. And also kind of what's happening right now. A little bit, just a little bit. Somebody the other day um, on set said something about like, oh, yeah, you like my virtual Oh, crazy. In real life? They well, said this? It, it was a joke, but with just how technology is advancing, it could end up that way. But I, I personally don't think that um, technology is going to be taking over anything completely anytime soon. And I completely agree. I think pornography, when particularly in America, people are able to let go of all those hangups, will just see it for the art that it is, because I see it as art. I'm very outspoken about that. What I do is an art, and if you don't think so, Politely and respectfully, you. Oh. <laughs> Anything else? No. All right. Is there any social media or any specific things you'd like to plug for our audience before we say farewell? Yearofthewhore.com and stevebalderson.com. I have a link tree somewhere. I don't remember what it is. Link tree slash Balderson or Steve Balderson. Well, whatever. Um, It'll be somewhere. It's, it's under the thingy. Yeah, we'll have it.
Um, so you just watched Keeping People Coming with Steve Balderson. Bye, guys. See ya. Peace.